How's it going everybody? Welcome back to another edition of the Good Bit Wrestling Podcast right here on CM42 TV. How's everybody doing? Hope everybody's doing well and I'd like to personally thank you all for tuning in for this exciting edition. I just know it's going to be so exciting. This is a rather, um, not nervy, scary, I don't know what the word is, I'm, I'm a bit tentative to record another one of these because... The idea is to record them all the time, like weekly, do you know what I mean? Just to kind of keep on top of all the sort of wrestling news and wrestling shows that go on. But uh, I did an episode of this when I talked about New Japan's Dominion. And I talked about WWE's Super Showdown shows and kind of compared them. Guess which one won. Um, (laughs) And I recorded for 38 minutes and only 27 of the minutes recorded properly and saved. So that was a rather annoying day in the life of me. So I couldn't get it to work. I was thinking about just trying to like work on it and work on it and work on it, but I just thought, you know what? It was quite not that it was negative, but I was kinda of moaning about Goldberg and Taker and how Goldberg um got knocked out and how he dropped Taker in his head, but then we didn't know that it was all a mistake because we didn't know Goldberg was knocked out and all that stuff. The whole Baron Corbin thing. Um, and I thought, you know what, it doesn't matter, it's not even worth it. So I didn't bother um worrying about it and getting myself stressed about it. So I said, right, okay, I'll just do it again, but I'll talk about kind of more positive things. So that never happened, and here we are now. So let's do it now. Let's talk about all the big news in the wrestling world today and could have picked a busier week to feckin' talk about this. I'd like, as I said, I'd like to do this weekly just because I feel like there's so much news that comes out um, every day, you know, because of social media and things like that, which is a good thing. So let's try and get on top of that. Might not happen. There might be weeks where we can leave it and, and not need to worry about it, but... Let's try and do weekly. So right now on recording date is June 30th. I'm expecting to release this on July 1st of 2019, which will be Monday. Which seems a bit daft because um, Monday, not that it starts a new era, but you know, it's Monday Night Raw. And then you've got Smackdown and I feel like any time you're talking about stuff that happened before then, every week you're totally outdated. I don't know if that's oversaturation, if that's the definition of oversaturation, it might be. But I'm kind of thinking, well, lots of things could change on Monday, so let's get my thoughts and my opinions settled down right here and recorded on tap, uh, or on tape, <laughs> um, before the madness ensues. And that madness, of course, um, regarding Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff. This is very interesting, because I guess the, the kind of news that's going around just now is that the new appointment of the new executive directors of Monday Night Raw and Tuesday Night Smackdown, later they'll be Friday Night Smackdown, uh, the... The introduction of the job and the start date of the new job. Congratulations to both Paul and Eric, the successful candidates and got the job. They must have done great in their interviews. Um, the start date isn't was it imminent? I don't know. Or if it's like a like a sort of slow burn, a slow uh, saturation, not a slow saturation. I don't know what I'm saying here. I guess it's just because there's so much going on just now. It's kind of hard to kind of put into words your thoughts. I'm trying to say, I'm getting distracted as well, I'm trying to say I don't know if Heyman and Bischoff start straight away or if it's like a slow burn, you know what I mean? Like starting a new job, you you do like a sort of training week (laughs) and then you go straight into it. I don't know if it's going to be like a training month for them. Not that they need it, do you know what I mean? Let's talk about both candidates, right? Let's talk about both appointments. You've got Paul Heyman who's going to be in charge, quote unquote, who will report directly to Vince McMahon on Mondays for Raw. And then you've got Eric Bischoff, which is the most interesting one, is going to report to Vince McMahon on Tuesdays, later to be Fridays, for Smackdown. Now, the Heyman one is uh, kind of a no-brainer, but then you think about the history there. It never ended well back in the day. It never ended well in the first brand split. It certainly never didn't end well on the relaunch of ECW, but that wasn't going to work from the get-go anyway. So it didn't matter if it was Paul Heyman or if it was fucking Triple H or Vince McMahon himself, that wouldn't have gone well anyway. So everybody's going well, they're going to fight again. But I don't know if they will fight again. They're both matured now, they're both, I guess, more pally and they both kind of get each other. But Heyman's been working as an on-screen talent instead of behind the scenes. I know as of late he's been kind of doing wee individual projects. Like I know he did a lot of the Ronda Rousey stuff. Obviously there's the Lesnar stuff. Um, I'm sure he's in very much creative control with his own promos and his own stories and stuff like that. The good thing about Heyman being there is because he's very much, you know, he's there every week, he knows the talent, he knows who's good, he knows what to do, Um, he knows who's there every week, he knows who works, he knows who might not work, he knows who connects, he is in touch with the product. 
Bischoff, on the other hand, I don't know Eric Bischoff's weekly routine, right? I don't know. I don't think he watches Raw every week. I'm assuming he's going to have to start. Um, but out of touch, I don't know if he is that. Uh, if there's other people for the job, I, I would say that's probably, you know, it's fair to say. Let me just throw out a name, you know. I don't know, maybe Triple H might have been yeah, another good idea. But I know Triple H is in charge of NXT. I think he's in charge of 205 Live. So maybe they wanted to keep him there because they're having ridiculous success there. Maybe not with 205 Live, but although I would say 205 Live is probably one of the better wrestling shows on the whole network every week, um, 205 Live is really good. It just has no buzz. That's the issue. Do you know what I mean? Like, the show would be so much better if there was a buzz, if it was done before the show instead of after SmackDown. You know, there was a period where that was the case for like eight weeks or something, and they were good shows. They all were good shows. I actually think it would be better if you did it in a smaller venue, like a sort of full sale thing, do some tapings, um, and I think, you know, the crowd would be more up for it, you know, they're going to see those wrestlers, you know, but I guess they're scared they wouldn't be able to sell many tickets, but it's full sale, I don't know how that works, I don't know if it's like an old sort of impact zone sort of thing, first come, first serve, get in for free, fill up the venue, and then special packages can be paid for sort of thing, they could do that. And you get your NXT and you get your NXT UK, they're the like sort of core wrestling shows and stuff. So would you put Triple H, Paul Levesque, as he's known in the executive world, put him in charge of SmackDown? I think that's a good call. But then who'd you put in, on top of, you know, NXT? Just do Matt Bloom or William Regal or whoever he's got working there? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's not a one-man job, you know? I'm sure it's not Triple H just being like, yes, I'm in charge. He, I guess he's like the Vince of NXT, like everything kind of goes through him. But I'm sure he's more of a team player, I don't know. Um, so I would say Heyman on Raw and Triple H on SmackDown, but then they're saying you know they're, they're, they're going to Fox and stuff, so they need folk to talk to the Fox executives. So they need Eric Bischoff to do that because he's got a history. Eric Bischoff is currently executive producing a film with uh, Chris Hemsworth about Hulk Hogan, so he'll be busy doing that. Do you know what I mean? I don't know how he can run SmackDown now. I think the Bischoff thing, I don't know how it's going to go. I really don't know. And you know what? Nobody knows how it's going to go. So all these people who are judging it, saying Bischoff ruined this and Bischoff ruined that, you don't know how this is going to go. Again, it's a new era. It's a new generation. It's a matured Bischoff, I guess. Listen, Bischoff in the 90s with Nitro, he was overly successful. Um, he created an amazing roster. He created an absolute buzz. He created a good television show. He made his show must-see every week. He made a party to attend. He's a smart guy. Then, you know, one thing led to another. WWE found Stone Cold Steve Austin and Bret Hart and DX and The Rock. And they had this amazing time. And I was listening to the Wrestling Observer radio this week. And, like, Meltzer was saying, like, there was no excuse for WCW to lose that Monday Night War. Because they had everything that WWE did not at the time. You know, the things I just mentioned. The undercard, the main eventers, the everything. But then when WWE responded with these amazing main events like Austin vs. Rock and Taker vs. Kane and Rock vs. Triple H and all this stuff, then WCW reacted with, you know, Hogan and Goldberg and Flair and whoever. Savage and Roddy Piper and Luger and all these sort of past stars. I say Sting, I know Sting was kind of homegrown and Goldberg was homegrown and stuff, but I guess they were the exceptions. But And Booker T later to be a big star and, and Scott Steiner and all those guys. So it just wasn't, you know, it wasn't the same. And, and you know, WCW had the money and they made it more of a more of a uh, fan-friendly environment to go to at times, but then WWE just counted it with this massive resurgence and just blew them out of the water and then WWE were, you know, it was the far better product. But when WCW started to panic, they brought in all these people and they brought in more stars, and it just didn't work, and one thing led to another, you know, they didn't want it on television, they lost a lot of money, you know, lost a lot of stars, they signed a lot of people to big contracts to do nothing, there were some injuries, you know, they lost Bret Hart, they lost Goldberg, all these things, um, and then people just got older, you know, not to mention Piper and Savage and Hogan and things like that, Sting, and not Sting, Nash and Hall, it just kind of fell apart, so then Bischoff kind of was put on the sidelines and all the people were put in charge. Then Bischoff was was put on WWE program as a character and he was brilliant. He was great as an on-screen talent, an on-screen personality, a character. Do you know what? When I first read this thing, when I first read the, the, the press release saying, breaking news, Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff to become directors, I thought it was like, these are your new GMs. 
Do you know what I mean? Like a storyline. And I was like, okay, great, because both guys are great on, on screen. They're both great promos. They're both great heels. But I thought, you know, you don't really need another heel authority figure, you know. But I thought I was well up for it because it would make something interesting for the TV show every week, having they two on as sort of authority figures. And then I looked into it and they're like fecking actual directors, like legit jobs. It's bonkers. It's, I still can't really get my head around it. I guess that's why I'm kind of rambling and talking nonsense here, but I was giving you a, a very loose history of WCW and, and Bischoff being in charge. Then when Bischoff left WWE, he wrote his book and stuff and he went on to do whatever. And then he does the TNA thing. And people are pointing fingers towards the TNA thing. And listen, Bischoff was not the one reason why TNA kind of didn't go very well when they tried to attack WWE at the time and go head to head because it was never going to happen in the first place because TNA was distinct, it was different and it was the alternative. You know? TNA was loved by everybody. Because it was that, it was the six-sided ring and your homegrown stars and then they came in and they tried to make it something that it wasn't. Smackdown already is a thing and Bischoff isn't going to try to make Smackdown something that it's not. It's already the second biggest show in the whole company. You know what I mean? It's not like Bischoff is going to take control of 205 Live, put it on another network next to Raw and try and compete. It's not going to happen. Smackdown's its own individual thing. It's already established. Bischoff, Bischoff, Bischoff has all the right in the world to, you know, work his magic there. Now, people are saying he's older and he's out of touch. He doesn't know the product very well. That is a fair, you know, a fair assessment. And, um, you know, I guess we don't know. We really, really don't know what's going to happen there. We just hope, you know what I mean, that it's going to be good. And I'd like to think so. He knows how to make stars, I guess. He knows what big fight feels and big matches feel like. You know what I mean? But then you got Heyman on Raw. And all I'm, all I'm thinking is positivity here. But who knows what could happen? Look at the past. You know, like... The job title must have been explained to Heyman massively here because the issue before was he was told he'd have full con- full control and he didn't have full control. The press release says he will report directly to Vince. So there, there tells me right now he's not going to have full control because everything's going to run through Vince. And I think Vince is out of touch a wee bit, but you know he is the owner of the fucking company and it just shows you that he knows now, and I'm, I don't know how long he's known for, that Raw is pretty pissed now, isn't it? Like, it's just not that good. Uh, and that's coming for me. And I love everything that the WWE does. I'm so ready every Monday night to watch Raw. I can't wait for it every week. And there is some, there's some you know things that are difficult to watch. There's some things I, I blatantly fast forward and ultimately don't look at and don't pay attention to. But there's a lot of good stars on there. The talent they have now is like maybe the most they've ever had. You know, you look at Nitro in like 99. You look at Raw in like 2000. You look at Smackdown in 2002. as these amazing rosters. Now is no different. I'm sorry. I know star power isn't really as much there. But in-ring talent and work rate and all that good stuff. Second to none right now. So when you think of Heyman, you think folk like Samoa Joe and Cesaro and people like that would be the sort of people, and even Seth Rollins, people that, you know, Heyman would focus on and try and push. I would love uh, a Cesaro and Samoa Joe number one contenders match to face Rollins at a pay-per-view and then have a Cesaro versus Rollins program. Cesaro could be like, we came in at the same time, you got all the opportunities, everybody liked you and chose you more, even though I look the way I look, even though I wrestle the way I wrestle, they just picked you because I'm the foreign guy, or I'm not as attractive, or I'm, you know, a different style, do you know what I mean, like, they could, there's so many ways they could go with that, Samoa Joe's the same, Samoa Joe saying he held the fort down and all over the world when I saw Seth Rollins have this rise, and I've, ha- I've had to sit here on the sideline and, and watch you take my spot, but I suppose Joe's now doing the, the Kofi stuff now, which is fine as well, I'll take Joe versus Kofi any day, and I wonder what's going to happen with Kofi, do you know what I mean, like, I'm seeing all these rumours about Shane McMahon, I don't think they'll do it, man, they'd be fucking dafties to do that, and, you know, they are dafties a lot of the time, but I don't think they'd do that to you, Joe, can have Shane beat Kofi? I don't think so, especially now with the new sort of regime, and surely Bischoff and, and Heyman would go, no thanks, that's not what we want, let's build some new stars. And I think Bischoff will do that, and I know Heyman will, because Heyman's got a history of building loads of stars from, you know, um, ECW back in the day, and then SmackDown in 02. And listen, SmackDown in 02, with the SmackDown 6, and Taker and Lesnar, 
you know, that was a great show. I remember watching that every Saturday morning and fucking loving it. I watched a lot of it recently when I kind of went back to that sort of time and kind of been watching through the weekly shows. Um, it's great. Like, see those tag matches with Eddie and Ray and Angle and Benoit and Edge and Chavo. It's so good. Some really, really good stuff. So that that's kind of some random thoughts about, you know, the new, the new jobs being appointed for Bischoff and Heyman. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens. Other news in WWE right now is the whole Seth Rollins thing, how he's just, you know, kind of shooting himself in the foot on social media. I don't have an issue with someone tweeting, do you know what I mean? Someone tweets something controversial and the whole world explodes as if they're not allowed to have a social media account. That's what Twitter's for. And he'd be daft to not use it, do you know what I mean? Um, Obviously, he's talking about how we're the best wrestling on the planet. I don't think he has any reason to not think that and I don't think he has any reason not to say it because he's the fucking world champion. I would be disappointed that you know if Rollins didn't think he was on the best wrestling show. And here, he might be one of the best wrestlers in the world. It's not for me to say, for my opinion wise, I'd say he's top 5 to 10, absolutely. He's the world champion, he's great, he's got a connection with the audience, he's good on promos, he's great in the ring, um, he's good in both roles, he's a good world champ sort of thing. You know, I, I I mean, if you look at the full package, he's pretty much it, you know. So I don't have an issue with Rollins saying he's the best or that he's, you know, Raw is the best or whatever. He'd be he'd be concerned if it wasn't, if he wasn't saying that. Um, And then you got the whole Will Ospreay thing. If I was going to give you my top five wrestlers in the world, you know, Will Ospreay would probably be in my top fucking three. I think he's amazing right now. His stuff in the Best of the Super Juniors was ridiculous. I just recently rewatched the final with him and Shingo Takagi and it was... Almost even better the second time. Because sometimes I go into these matches, especially the New Japan matches, expecting them to be so great. And although they are so great, I was expecting it anyway, so it doesn't have so much of an impact. But when I go watch them again and I go back to watch them, I'm like, oh my god, this match was amazing. And then he had the match at Dominion with Dragon Lee, which was great as well, and he won the title. So I'm very, very impressed and very happy that Will Os- we're living in an era of Will Ospreay just now, so... You know how uh, him and Heyman have a wee bit of a relationship there? How amazing, how funny would it be if Heyman just phones him and it's just like, here, if I can get this to work, would you come a, come to my new show on Monday and try and do an in-ring with Seth? Can we have a match booked between Rollins and Osprey, even though we're in both two completely different continents and two completely different companies signed to multi-year deals and being champions? Could that be a possibility? Of course it could. It's 2019. Anything's possible nowadays, you know? So that would be amazing. That would be mad. But I don't think that will happen. Um, yeah, so that's what I was saying. Rollins and Osprey. Listen, it's just free promotion for Osprey. He'll take it. You know what I mean? He's not getting offended the fact that Rollins called him we. You know what I mean? So that's fine. Uh, I'll just quickly touch on Fighter Fest, the all elite wrestling show that was this past Saturday. A really fun show. Really enjoyed it. Oh, also ROH's pay per view, best in the world. That was interesting. I don't really, let's talk about Best in the World first and then we'll finish on Fighter Fest. Best in the World was really interesting because I don't really pay attention to ROH as much as I would like to and as much as I used to. It's just harder to watch now, it's not the same company, it's not the same show. Um, There's something flat about it, you know what I mean? There's nothing, there's no urgency to watch it. Like I used to love watching ROH every week but then the stars kind of fizzled out and stuff and that's just, that's just the nature of the business but... um, I used to love the show and now it's just I never watch it. I'll check in, you know, the kind of bigger pay-per-views. I'll watch Best in the World. I'll watch Final Battle. What are the other ones? Glory by Honor? Is that still a thing? Supercard of Honor? I don't know. I watched G1 Supercard, or at least some of it, back at WrestleMania weekend. I enjoyed that. I thought the New Japan stuff was far superior than the ROH stuff. but And, you know, any of the pay-per-views that come out, I'll just kind of watch them and, and enjoy. Every time I watch an ROH show, I enjoy it. I think, okay, this is a good show, but it's nothing must-see. It's nothing special. And Best in the World this past Friday, I think, was very much that. It was all right. A few good matches. I thought Bandido and Shane Taylor's match was particularly good. Match of the night, probably. Um, The six-man tag was good with Marty Scurrow and stuff. He's obviously never going to disappoint. but um, And I thought Kenny King and Jay Lethal's match was good. This is just off the top of my head. But other than that, nothing special whatsoever. But it's always nice to see ROH putting on a good show. And again, it was just weird. It was just a weird atmosphere to the show. Looked as if, like, we're not really enjoying it. But yeah, we bought a ticket, so... And the crowd wasn't particularly full. But, you know, I'm not expecting a massive crowd. But it didn't look didn't look busy at all. Um, Jeff Cobb and Matt Taven was the main event. Matt Taven's the current world champion. Like, I think he's alright. He's good. 
Jeff Cobb's all right. It reminds me of Taz. The match was really rushed. It was like nine minutes or something. It was nothing. And Taven retained. So, yeah. It was definitely not the best in the world. It's a touchy uh, phrase right now. But it was okay. And then we had All Elite Wrestling's second ever show, Fighter Fest, this past Saturday. I was a little bit confused about this at first because I didn't realise it was going to be like an actual pay-per-view sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? Like, I thought they kept promoting it as like a cross-promotion thing with the CEO gaming convention, which is absolutely fine. You know, it's a good thing to actually have those connections, I think. I like the fact that they're partnering with OWE, you know what I mean? Like, it's such a big market in China. There's such a gap there. So that's a really good market to go into. So it's like, okay, we're, we're, we're partnering with, you know, the gaming thing. And then Fight for the Fallen in two weeks' time, it's like this whole charity gig thing. So it's like partnering with that charity. And it's very smart. But I guess they're kind of promoting them as sort of transitional shows. The next big one being All Out on August the 31st, which looks as if it's going to be mental because it will lead into the weekly show and you're crowning your first world champion. And it's the same day. It's like the busiest day in wrestling history. So you got AEW All Out. You've got NXT UK TakeOver Cardiff, which all the U NXT shows and TakeOvers, whether it be normal NXT or UK, are always great. And then you got a UFC show that day and a New Japan show in London. Royal Quest, I think it's called. And by the way, the New Japan uh, G1 Climax 2019 starts on Saturday. On Saturday. On Saturday. And I am excited for it. I'm really looking forward. I'm going to try and watch it as much as I can this year. Last year, I just, I was like, there's so much here and there's so many Omega matches I wanted to watch. But the lineup is ridiculous this year with everybody in it. But the return of Kenta and Moxley and Tanahashi's in it. Tanahashi's like so beat up and so injured. But he's still going to be in this G1. He's still going to wrestle all these matches. God bless him. Um, what was I saying? Yeah, AEW. So I didn't realise it was going to be such a big show, but Fighter Fest was. It was just another big show. And it was really good. I really enjoyed it. It was really fun. Not quite as good or significant as Double or Nothing, but it was never going to be that anyway. Um, we had a few good matches. I thought the pre-show for Fighter Fest was was pretty. I don't want to say terrible, but not good at all. Like, um, and I can't say not good. I didn't enjoy it as much. I thought that the tag match was was good and stuff. I thought Private Party never heard of them, never seen them. Thought they did a good showing. Always good to see best friends in SCU. But then they had the sort of the women's match. I think Ali's really good, but it's just the match I didn't enjoy at all. And then the hardcore match I thought was going to be really fun. Wasn't at all. With Michael Nakazawa and uh, Alex Jabaley, I think his name was. And then the, the main show was good, man. You know, Daniels and Shima, was two legends. That was good fun. I thought the women's triple threat match with, let's try and get the names right, Yuka, Za Sakaz Yuka Sakazaki, Nyla Rose and Riho. It was a really good match, actually. Um, the Fatal 4-Way with Adam Page, MGF, Jimmy Havoc and Jungle Boy was good. Cody and Darby Allen was very interesting. Yeah, I watched that again today for a second time and or I rewatched it. And I enjoyed it better the second time. I liked the time limit draw. I liked the fact they kind of got it out of the way early. Do you know what I mean? Like we're, we're talking about you know wins and losses here and pinfalls and submissions are going to be really important. However, this is a time limit game. It's real um, time limits will make a difference and it did it was, I thought it was it was executed very well actually Cody and, and this Darby Allen guy what was he doing I mean I thought he, do you know what is about him I think he's like 22 23 like he's like my age which I always find really weird like see Tyler Bate and stuff like they're just unbelievable athletes and performers it's like makes me kind of sad um, the Darby Allen guy has a really good look he looks so different he's got a good story behind him uh, and I think he's like a great addition to the roster, but he's just he's just odd, and I guess that's a good thing. He's just odd. It looks as if he shouldn't even be there, and I guess that's a good thing. But him and Cody had a good match. The time limit thing was really good. How he just couldn't beat him in the time limit. He kept kicking out of things, and he just couldn't get the three count before the time ran out. So, and then the whole Ty Dillinger thing. Oh my god, that chair shot! The whole wrestling world was fucking freaking out. Listen. This, I'll, I'll tell you right now, I don't even work for the AEW. They probably should hire me because I would, able to, I would be able to get them great ratings. But I don't work for the AEW. And I'll tell you right now, the plan is not to have unprotected chair shots all the time. No chance. This is a one-time thing, or at least it'll happen again. It won't happen for a long time. Um, the unprotected chair shot thing, it's not particularly lovely to watch. It's very dangerous. However, I feckin' popped when I saw it. I went, oh, like a pure... And that's a good thing. Like, you need reactions like that. 
Cody taking one for the team. I hope he's all right. I heard there was no concussion. I just heard there was staples. And uh, it sets up a great thing between Sean Spears and Cody. Um, the story could be, you know, like, Cody leaves WWE and he immediately gets all the success. Or when he was in WWE, he got this all the success because of who he was. And then Sean Spears can say, I was in WWE the same time as you. I got released and came back, got released and came back. I worked for everything and I got nothing. I've left WWE now and I'm getting nothing. Uh, just because you're the EVP doesn't mean you get a special treatment. I'm going to take your spot and that could be your whole story. There's your match for All Out. Cody versus Sean Spears. The winner of that match gets the first shot at the new AEW World title champion. There's your... I mean, book me and sign me now, AEW, because I can I can write for you. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but it's a good show anyway. I think that'd be very interesting and a match I would happily pay money to see. Um, Let's see. What else was there? So then you had that match. Then you had the six-man tag. Was unreal with the Elite versus the Lucha Bros and Laredo Kid. I love the Lucha Brothers. Pentagon Jr. is a star. Obviously, the Elite are all ridiculous stars. They're going to be great. They are great. And then the main event didn't do much for me. I'm not going to lie. I didn't love it between John Moxley and Joey Janela in this non-sanctioned match. It was all right. Always nice to see. Always, you know, good to get a wee bit of va- variety on these shows, having a sort of hardcore, um, unsanctioned match. Didn't do much for me. There was something that just didn't click with me. I thought it was good. I appreciated the effort. I, I appreciated the fucking no shoes and socks on thumbtacks. I appreciated the barbed wire boards and the elbow drop off the ladder to the table. I appreciate all these things, but just something about it. There was just no magic there, so... Um, yeah, good show, fun show. I'm looking forward to Fight for the Fallen in two weeks' time, but I'm even more excited for uh, All Out and even more excited for their weekly show. It's going to be so much fun having that every week, um, seeing all the characters develop and seeing the commentary team develop. By the way, there was this guy on the commentary at Fighter Fest called Golden Boy, and he was really, really good. He was really good, and I think that's the way to go. Golden Boy, Excalibur, and JR. Excalibur's great. He's so good. I've, I've known that for years, and JR's the greatest ever. I love the dynamic and the flow between the three of them. The Alex Marvez guy, I'm sure he's a nice guy. He looks like a nice guy, but he just wasn't. He just wasn't that good. And obviously, you can work on things. I'm sure he'll get better. But the Golden Boy showed him up big time. And like the Golden Boy, like new stuff <laughs> that that Marvez obviously just didn't sound like he did know. And he just was more educated. It sounded like he had more to contribute. He, he seemed happier to be there than Alex did. You know, um, he seemed very comfortable. And that was a good thing. Very easy to listen to. I thought they did a good job. Um, I keep fantasy booking the first show, the first weekly show of AEW Dynamite or whatever, which I don't like. I don't like the name of that show, but I'm sure it'll grow on me. Um, I guess it's because it was TNT, but whatever. Um, I keep booking the first show. I keep saying, what would you do? What would you have as your first match? You know, I'm sure that the world champion, whether it be Hangman or whether it be Jericho, I think it's going to be Jericho who's the first world champion. Um whether you have him come out first and do a promo saying I'm the world champ, blah, blah, blah. And then your first match, I think it should be some form of like big over-the-top tag match. Like say do the Young Bucks versus SCU or the Best Friends versus the Lucha Bros. A big over-the-top 20-minute tag match is your first ever TV match. And in the main event of your first TV show, have a world title match. That's what I think. I think have you know Jericho defend against whoever, Joey Janela or... MJF or whoever or have them um, or Dustin even Dustin Rhodes or Ty Dillinger or whoever Cody even have a big title match as your main event of your first show and I think you're off you know what I mean set up for the next show as well and just I mean it's just going to be so much fun live every week two hours on a Wednesday oh salivating literally at the idea so there you go this has been the good bit wrestling podcast ladies and gentlemen I know it's just been a total ramble and I feel like I rush these things, but you got a lot to say. The passion definitely comes out when I talk about wrestling in this form, this informal form. Um, and uh, we'll try and... Uh, just like AEW is going weekly, we'll try and make this weekly. We'll try and stay on top of so much wrestling stuff. I didn't talk about Stomping Grounds. I enjoyed Stomping Grounds. I thought it was a good show. Um, I thought the, the last two matches just weren't that good, but I thought everything else was pretty good. But other than that, we got Extreme Rules coming up. The huge match. Oh my god. It's going to be Seth Rollins and Becky Lynch in a mixed tag team match against Baron Corbin and Lacey Evans. 
in a winner take all tag match, which we don't need to see. Um, so that's fine. Listen, I was saying this to my dad the other day. I don't mind having Baron Corbin in a world title match, just like I don't mind having anybody in a world title match. But three in a row, no thanks. That's where you're going wrong, WWE. In fact, you're bringing back The Undertaker for a tag match with Roman Reigns, Shane and Drew. That's a great thing and you've done well. But it's not going to save the fact that the main event of that show is another Corbin, Lacey Evans title shot. They weren't good the first time. They were a bit better the second time. What makes you think it's going to be even better the third time? I don't know, but who cares? Uh, yeah, Raw's tomorrow. We'll see if, or tonight when you're listening to this, we'll see if the effects of Heyman starts immediately. I don't think it will. I think it'll take a couple of weeks to get into, which is fine. It makes it exciting to watch every week. And we'll see what happens with fucking Bischoff. It's so intriguing. It's so intriguing. What an amazing time to be a wrestling fan. You got this absolutely fascinating stuff going on behind the scenes of WWE, and you got this great wrestling on 205 Live in NXT and NXT UK, and then you got this boom period happening with AEW, and you got this amazing wrestling and this great tournament starting with New Japan. What an amazing time to be a wrestling fan right now. We're so lucky. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening slash watching. Take care of yourselves wherever you are around the world. Hopefully you can continue to enjoy the content here on CM42 TV. We're doing a lot of reaction videos and I'm having a blast doing them. It's really reignited my love for this. So um, hopefully you guys are enjoying them. So until next time, folks, thank you very much. Take care of yourselves. Go and watch some wrestling, especially some New Japan, some AEW, and especially some WWE, so we can see what happens this Monday and Tuesday with Eric Bischoff and Paul Heyman. They are back! <laughs>